Can history ever be objective? There are some aspects of history which are, whether Columbus sailed in 1492, whether Constantine converted to Christianity, whether the US was founded as a Christian nation. This objective type of history, based on historical texts and archaeological evidence, relies on a preponderance of evidence to validate a claim. According to this style of observing the past, there is fact and error and historians, armchair and professional, rightly quibble over details of these on an evidentiary basis. History like this aspires to be a science like chemistry with clear, objective lines, viewing the past from a sort of bird's eye view. It comprises the majority of what academia considers to be the rightful place of the discipline. But it's not the entire picture. There is also perspective-based history, the type which knowingly and consciously tries to enter into the frame of view of a historical side. Historian Jacques Barzon, in his book Cleo and the Doctors, describes it like this. Whoever wants to know the heart and mind of a time period must study its individuals, its arts, and its thoughts. Without understanding the individual, history remains cold, distant, and lifeless. History is the movement of many people, with many motivations and many ways of thinking. We look into the world and see such an enormous diversity of view and almost limitless perspectives. History this way enlightens our understanding of a more human aspect of the past. How did people think about themselves and the world? How did this thinking shape the way they acted? How did they live? What did they think was good? What moral frameworks did they follow? What moral conflicts did they encounter? How are we to understand them as people, fully human, living, breathing, thinking, and loving the same as we do? History this way is not a problem to be solved, but a collection of stories to ponder. Historian G.M. Trevelyan, in his History of England, puts it like this. The poetry of history lies in the quasi-miraculous fact that once on this earth, once on this familiar spot of ground, walked other men and women, as actual as we are today, thinking their own thoughts, swayed by their own passions, meeting their own adventures. Through this more restful method, we feel compassion for, understanding of, and perhaps even admiration of those historical figures, many of whom were directly opposed to each other in their time. One compelling example era of this is the French Revolutionary period. If we limit ourselves to the strict version of history, we might be able to tell very little. It began in 1789 due to tensions over the role of the aristocracy and clergy and a feeling amongst the bourgeoisie that they weren't pulling their societal weight aided by ideas of radical liberalism and resulted in the downfall of the French monarchy and the reign of terror until 1794 and the establishment of the directory in 1795. Very nice, sort of dry, limited, but with greater certainty within its limitation. If we ask ourselves according to the second mode of study, we might find more significance a struggle between nobility and bourgeois, democracy and monarchy, left and right, tradition and progress. Deeper still, we see a personal drama rivaling what any novelist could imagine with thousands of fascinating aspects and curves of perspective. On the one hand, the idealists like Voltaire, so clever and enigmatic, brilliant, irreverent, but feet, prideful, and difficult, countering Christianity with a liberal rigor which would become the standard of the developed world. On the other, Marie Antoinette, beautiful, charming, and decadent, inheriting all the wealth and privilege of a Habsburg queen, embodying at one and the same time the magnificent yet selfish excess which made the Parisians so despise her, and the last gasps of French noblesse oblige, which made her a symbol of old-world beauty. These two were in existential conflict with each other, yet we who don't share their circumstances are not forced to choose one side to be on. And in fact, if we demand that of ourselves, we cut ourselves off from truly understanding a large portion of how the history actually occurred. Not the dates and times and some shallow understanding of the intellectual movements, but how the people thought and felt and why. Through trying to really see the world as they did and humanize historical figures, we breathe life into what would otherwise be akin to studying inanimate objects bumping into each other through time like marbles. And in this way, we study better because we see people in history as they truly were, not from one side or another, but from all sides 
and through all eyes. High school history teachers might beg to differ, which is why YouTube Civil War history enthusiast Atten Shay Films, I think his real name is Andy, made a video about three years ago venting his frustration with the historical film Gods and Generals. Gods and Generals is the most offensive Civil War movie since the birth of a nation. It's also objectively terrible. Gods and Generals is a movie about the Civil War which is warm towards the Southern cause, portraying it in an aspirational way and highlighting its nobler aspects and figures. Which to Andy, who views the Civil War through the sort of level one lens of history, is infuriating. But oddly enough, this dull, flaccid, utterly inane excuse for entertainment is an extremely effective piece of propaganda. Watching this, I get the creepy sense that the entire reason Gods and Generals exists is to convince Civil War buffs that the Confederacy wasn't really all that bad, that it was about states' rights after all, and that the antebellum South was just a porch-sittin', lemonade-sippin' paradise. Andy is part of that subculture which will endlessly quibble over whether the North or South was right in the Civil War. I'd like to get one thing absolutely clear. The Confederate States of America existed primarily to preserve and expand the institution of slavery. Confederate soldiers were fighting for slavery, and they knew it. That's not an opinion, it's a fact. As the saying goes, Facts don't care about your feelings. And we can tell how deep in this culture he is through animosity that he both gives and expects in return. But I don't think the problem here is whether Andy is technically right according to the level one history or not. Yes, the Civil War was about slavery. Does that mean that Andy wins the historical game? He can pack up his historically accurate musket and go home. <laughs> Believe me, I've had all of the long-winded discussions out there about Abraham Lincoln's true opinions about emancipation or cotton tariffs or the constitutionality of secession. The subculture of Civil War enthusiasts tends to obsess over these questions as if they are some sort of mathematical formula where if you get all of the variables right, there will be a right and wrong answer. The question of who was right in the Civil War becomes an all-consuming sort of obsession, one which I've heard and participated in myself many times. It's not the worst question, I guess. I mean, Andy has a whole YouTube channel about it. And just to clear the air, yes, my personal opinion is that the Civil War was about slavery in the sense that it was the issue which ignited the flames. That is clearly reflected in the eagerness of Southern elites to explicitly, legally protect it. I don't think anybody can take a good, thorough look at the historical evidence and not realize this. So, I sympathize with Andy's frustration at this debate amongst Civil War history enthusiasts. There are a lot of sort of emotionally charged cultural subtexts muddying the waters of what is ultimately a pretty open and shut issue, and I'm not here to try and relitigate that. But to say that the Civil War was fought over slavery is somewhat akin to saying the War for Independence was fought over attacks on tea. The specifics may be right, it's not wrong. It gets the job done for a multiple choice test, we may perhaps be satisfied to stop there. And for those who view history as a competition to be won, they may feel vindicated. But history, of course, is not a game to be won, it's a story. This answer is the start, not the finish line. As we dive deeper still, we can see complex dynamics of regional, cultural, economic, and constitutional questions questions which echo into our day. We can see figures, relationships, enigmatic perspectives and realize from these that the true contours of this era are so different from our own that we will never understand it if we continue to view it as words on paper, dates, and documents, numbers. A truer understanding of history is an understanding of the people who lived the complexities of their lives and times no more obviously cut and dry than our own. Such an understanding looks through the eyes of both Lincoln and Lee, Douglas and Calhoun. And one of the best mediums we have to invoke this type of deeper knowledge is through art, whether from the era itself or the modern art of filmmaking. Through films, we enter emotionally into this world from the eyes of the people who would see it as good. This does not require us to change any aspect of our knowledge of the historical record. 
rather that we see better the way the people on any side may have thought about themselves, that we enter into the complexities of history in the most meaningful way for us humans emotionally. Andy has a whole section of his video about propaganda. Even if I disagree with the message, I can still take a good propaganda film if it's well made or entertaining. But whether benignly thought-provoking or blatantly ideological, these movies have one thing in common. The filmmakers are trying to sell you something. In the case of Gods and Generals, director Ron Maxwell is pushing the tired, old, thoroughly debunked right-wing talking points of the lost cause myth. But Andy, there's a big difference between fictional characters in a movie expressing certain opinions. Figure a man's only good for one oath at a time. I took mine to the Confederate States of America. And a filmmaker trying to indoctrinate his or her audience with a specific political agenda. I think Andy is right to mention that every filmmaker is promoting a value or message, however subconscious, so just doing that isn't propaganda. Getting us to see someone as sympathetic isn't propaganda. And although Andy seems smart enough, I don't think he's the muse of propaganda to just intuit for us whether a work is propaganda or not. There ought to be something a little more objective. Edward Bernays, who is said to be the father of public relations, indicates in his 1928 book Propaganda that propaganda is the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses, and that it is to regiment the public mind every bit as much as the army regiments their bodies. So there's an element of duplicitousness and coercion to propaganda. It's not necessarily deceitful, but it can be, and moreover, it seeks to manufacture uniformity of vision. Political scientist Harold Laswell said propaganda simplifies complex situations, reducing them to the level at which the desired end can appear as desirable. And of course, no overview of propaganda would be complete without some Noam Chomsky, who observed of media manipulation that the standard way to do this is to resort to what in more honest days was called propaganda, manufacture of consent. Propaganda is enforced, manipulative, seeking to control, not to illuminate, to simplify, not complicate. Telling a story from one perspective is only propaganda if it is the only strictly enforced version allowed, if its effects are in manufactured unison. It also tends to go beyond simply telling a story to try and force a conclusion into the mind of the viewer never comfortable in letting him simply rest in the contradiction of reality. So, Andy takes issue with the fact that the film Gods and Generals emotionally suggests the audience sympathize in some way with the Confederacy. This might fit whatever Andy sees as propaganda, but does this meet the true standard of propaganda, or is it just a perspective Andy doesn't like? Consider the coronation scene from Sofia Coppola's film Marie Antoinette. <laughs> Sofia Coppola is not, I think, suggesting that the viewers all become staunch French monarchists. It's a cool scene, though. It makes the monarchy look really magnificent. Notice the triumphant music, bright colors, monarchic symbolism, and cheering crowds. If I made a 45-minute long video about how bad and unethical the monarchical system of 18th century France was, and how this scene is propaganda for the monarchy, you might respond that I should respectfully calm down. Such a rant might imply that when a shiny thing is dangled in front of our eyes, we just lose all reason or sense of objectivity. In addition to being a total buzzkill, though, I'd actually be arguing against my audience's correct intuition to integrate this aspect of history as one brushstroke in a massive painting, a wrinkle or an aspect of the French Revolutionary period that, even if Voltaire was completely right, there may have simultaneously been something really beautiful in the monarchy which drew people's hearts. Through scenes like this one, we are emotionally drawn in to see what that might be, and so a new layer of texture is added to our growing understanding of the story. I, for my part, 
am more liberal, a product of my own time and culture. But my liberalism is enhanced through this texture. In the same way, Andy takes issue with, I'll grant you that loyal slaves existed, but I question Ron Maxwell's choice to feature these slave characters specifically in his film, and no others. This is a whitewashed, hugely historically inaccurate portrayal of American slavery. It wasn't like this. It was like this. Come on, where's the Merriman? Move your feet! The way I see it, if you're a filmmaker and you want to portray American slavery, you have an obligation to depict it accurately. This PG-13, kid-friendly, cotton candy bullshit leads the general movie-going public to think that slavery wasn't all that bad. And that has dangerous, real-world ramifications. And I, I think he would have a point if this movie was the only approved narrative exclusively offered for public consideration. But really, it highlights what Andy himself acknowledges is historically accurate, and so it should supplement the other works of art which we also view, like Lincoln or 12 Years a Slave, exploring other human aspects of the period. And in a media environment which produced Amistad, Roots, Django Unchained, Glory, Beloved, The Good Bird, Harriet, Mandingo, Burn, Goodbye Uncle Tom, Daughters of the Dust, Freedom, The Long Song, Amazing Grace, The Journey of August King, and others, I think we've got the message, Andy. There is a world where gods and generals might be propaganda, but it's not this one. I think there's room for a movie which chooses to emphasize a different, also not untrue, aspect of the Civil War. And while I understand that the objection is cherry-picking historical examples to paint an inaccurate picture, I don't think Andy is giving the audience enough credit. I think we can look at historical exceptions too, without imagining them to be the standard. And this is my problem, really, I think, most fundamentally with Andy's vitriol against gods and generals. He's so deeply ensconced in the nerd sport of Civil War apologetics that he's forgotten what history is even for. But that's a contradiction. How can we both see the nobility in and wickedness of the Confederate cause? There can only be one. But why? That's, that's culture. That's human life. And that's reality. There are contradictions which aren't able to be perfectly solved. Who said that there had to be one right answer in human history? Modern France takes pride in the Cathedral of Notre Dame, Versailles, and the Arc de Triomphe, all at the same time, even though they are sort of manifestations of contradictions. But they're also all real representations of the accomplishments of French culture and history. We don't have to resolve them. Contradictions are just there. And history, if we study it properly, teaches us why, without compelling us to answer back.